This is Viewpoint. Welcome to Viewpoint, I'm Doug Petcash. The first session of the 67th Idaho Legislature entered its 12th week last week. Lawmakers had a target date of March 24th to adjourn sine die, but their business carried over longer than that. For those of you new to the state, the Idaho Legislature is a part-time legislature. It's only in session three to four months at the beginning of each year. The 2023 session started back on January 9th with Governor Brad Little's State of the State address. The session got off to a relatively slow start. When we focused on the session four weeks ago here on Viewpoint, only 15 bills had come across the governor's desk and he had signed 11 of them. Lawmakers picked up the pace substantially after that. As of the taping of this show Thursday morning, 227 bills had come across his desk, so 212 more in the last four weeks. He has vetoed two. He vetoed a bill that would have allowed parents to teach their kids driver's ed and another on property tax relief. The property tax issue has since been remedied with a new bill the governor likes. The legislature approved his Idaho Launch Grants program to provide $8,000 to qualifying Idaho high school seniors for enrollment in an Idaho-based education or training program geared toward jobs in high demand in Idaho. The legislature is also focused on social issues, including clarifying Idaho's anti-abortion law. It approved the so-called bathroom bill that will require Idaho public schools to keep bathrooms and changing rooms separate based on biological sex, as well as a bill to ban gender affirming care for minors. The governor also signed into law a bill allowing execution by firing squad when lethal injection is unavailable. This is just to name a few. The legislature is dealing with many other issues, including the big budget, such as the education budget. So there's a lot to get to today as we recap the bigger happenings of the 2023 legislative session. My guests are Boise State University political science professor Dr. Jacqueline Kettler and KTBB political chief political reporter Joe Paris. Thanks both of you for being here today. Um, Joe, first of all, let's start with you. Uh, they did miss that target date of the 24th to adjourn. What pushed it back? You know, there's a lot of conversations about what to do on property tax. And uh, just to go back for a second, that March 24th deadline, it was a self-imposed yeah, deadline. Yeah. It's kind of what the leadership at the state house was saying, okay, we should get everything done by date. then. <laughs> a target date, yeah. And it was a pretty good target date in the sense of this is going to give us enough time to get things done. Now, there were some property tax discussions and some concerns with the property tax bill that really kind of created a rewrite. So that kind of complicated some situations. And then they're also kind of working through some budgets as well. And uh, Dr. Kettler, when you see this like flurry of activity at the end of a session, and it happens every year, what are your concerns about the pace? Right. Well, I mean, we know that they're trying to get a lot done, right? And they're they're ready to kind of finish up, go home. But at the same time, sometimes you see bills move really fast here at the end of the session. So there can be concerns about transparency, how much time we get to really dive into the legislation that's being proposed or debated, as well as are there opportunities for the public to offer comments and engagement along the way as well. Yeah. And Joe, um, you know, some of the big issues that we talked about um, that have taken up a lot of the time mm -hmm. and a lot of the space, frankly, in the coverage, too, are those social issues, including um, the bathroom bill. And, uh, you know, and so that was a lot of discussion with yeah. the bathroom bill. What does it do? So the bathroom bill is really something that you've, you've seen coast to coast. It's not just in Idaho. And there are some conservative groups that have kind of workshops and legislation that says we believe that biological boys and biological girls should be separated based on their the, uh, the gender they were assigned at birth. So all high school bathrooms, all high school changing rooms, high school locker rooms, the biological males have to go in the boys' locker room. Biological women have to go in the women's locker room. So there's questions about what about trans students. And so what this legislation does says, even if you're a trans man or a woman, you have to go to the bathroom that your biological, biological. sex marker was at birth. Now. There is in the legislation saying that you have to create a special circumstance. A reasonable accommodation. Right? right. So if, you know, there's a student that they, they want to go into one bathroom and that's the policy is against the law now, they have to make sure there's, a, I guess, a private bathroom available for them. And to be clear, lawmakers said this wasn't just about transgender students. They said there are other students that maybe have problems with bullying or they're not comfortable in the bathroom. So this okay. gives them, uh, I guess, an option in state law to be comfortable at school. And Dr. Kettler, Joe touched on a little bit, but this is something, you know, some of these bills do tend to pop up around the country, don't they? Yeah, we see a very similar legislation being proposed across many states and, and, and passed in many states. There's some groups that have been really active and kind of crafting this legislation so that's been shared in some states. In other places, these are ideas that have been debated for a while. And so it's kind of interesting that this year we're, we've seen uh, quite a bit of these social issues have more success in actually getting passed. 
And another big one, Joe, has been the, um, the bill that uh, would ban gender affirming care right. for, uh, for minors. And this one is very similar to what we just talked about. There are some conservative groups coast to coast that have really pushed this idea that minors should not be getting any type of hormone therapy or surgery uh, for, for gender dysphoria, uh, for transgender children really that this is the path they go on you know um, with medical professionals they get hormones and they get different types of things to supplement their transition well the state of idaho the legislature said we don't think anyone under 18 should be going through hormone or puberty blockers or getting any surgery until they're 18. Um, we heard from lawmakers that were in you know favor of the idea saying that we think 18 is is a big number mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a number that you know age that you you do a lot of things and we don't think people below 18 should okay. be making these big decisions now uh, critics of that say that you know this is very a damaging policy and that there are children that may have to leave the state because if they've started at age 14 a hormone and a therapy regimen and now at age 15 or 16 they have to go off and they want to continue that uh, that the right. medical plan they can't do so in Idaho and uh, Jackie this is uh, tip typically in Republican states that we're seeing this right yeah we've seen very similar legislation pass in uh, I think like six to eight states already this year and so it's been been something that we've seen really in a lot of more Republican leaning states than them take tackle we saw a similar proposal last year here in the Idaho legislature it didn't it didn't make it out of the Senate um, so I think many many expected it to, to return this session and Joe another one of the big things too is the um, the firing squad bill when people first yes. heard it it was like what we're bringing back the firing squad some people um, but what is the reasoning behind adding that to the law yeah so we're bringing it back into the law yeah actually. bringing it back because it, until uh, actually 2009, 2009. yeah yes it, it had never been used in the state of Idaho to be clear but it was on the books and long story short Idaho's not alone in this getting lethal injection drugs right now is very difficult the, the pharmaceutical companies that manufacture the drugs they've made a decision a policy decision we don't want to be associated with the death penalty with lethal injection so these drugs are very difficult to obtain now and in a state like Idaho where you have somebody like Gerald Pizzuto who has been on death row and the governor has been very clear in his message that he wants to see this man executed well you can't do an execution if you don't have the drugs so really the thing you have to do is find a secondary method and that's what the firing squad is and lawmakers are a proponent of the idea said this is a, a method of execution that has passed constitutional muster. Other states have ever been able to say, okay, we know the Supreme Court will allow the firing squad. The state of Utah, for example, has it. Um, so that's kind of what it was. As Oklahoma, well, oh yeah. And, one other. and we're seeing a bunch of other states start to approach the conversation because if they believe in capital punishment and you can't get the drugs to do it, then effectively you can't carry out the sentence. Yeah, and, and Jackie, how, would, how do you see this, like the political debate over this? I think the, uh, the Democrats called it barbaric, I, I think was one of the words that they yeah. It's been really interesting over the last decade or so. We've had some public opinion shifting on the death penalty in general and capital punishment with particularly some kind of partisan um, polarization where Democrats are becoming more and more opposed to the death penalty. So it's, it's interesting how there's some partisan arguments here along with just broader arguments about whether we should be using capital punishment and the death penalty and the, separate from the conversation of, okay, if we're going to have it, how do we actually carry it out? And there's a major Idaho case that plays into that, Christopher Tapp and Charles Fain, because there are proponents, or I guess I would say uh, critics at the state house of the policy to have the firing squad that said, look, here in the state of Idaho, we have two cases right here where somebody was, was convicted and they, were, they have a sentence and blah, blah, blah. Well, then we found out years later that we got it wrong. Well, if we had executed that person, it would have been too late. So here in Idaho and Boise, with so much attention at the Capitol with wrongful convictions, there's there's been people that say, we just heard from people over the last few years, like Christopher Tapp and Charles Fain, who, you know, we know their stories and we don't want to execute someone and then find out later that we messed up. So that's kind of the conversation over there. And, and let's go back to property taxes. Sure. You, met, you mentioned that before, and it was one of Governor Little's top priorities that he wanted. I think it was 120 million he wanted to set aside from the $1.6 billion budget uh, surplus that the legislature dealt with on a special session last year. He actually vetoed the first one that came out, calling it a hodgepodge of, of policy intermingled with property tax relief. But there's been a remedy to that in just a couple days. Yeah, so when the governor vetoed House Bill 292 um, on property tax, he made it clear that he saw issues with the funding mechanism in terms of the, prior, 
prioritization of where tax dollars were going to go. He was worried that by putting dollars into this program, it would compromise the Tecum funds and then it would compromise some major infrastructure projects across Idaho. There was also questions about funding the public defenders because when you start moving money around, you take sales tax revenue from one spot and then you take the grocery, or not the grocery tax, but the internet sales tax going here and there. So when you start moving these pieces around, sometimes there are concerns that, okay, well, this money was spoken for, but now we're moving it over here. So long story short, I know that might be confusing. The governor had some problems he saw with it. Lawmakers said, okay, we hear you, we're gonna fix those and they did with a trailer bill yeah and you know Jackie it was such a big issue I mean politically they kind of probably had to get something done this session right yeah we know this is one of the top priorities for a lot of citizens in the state right to getting some property tax relief that people are struggling they're noticing it in their daily lives and it's one of the issues that people really identified as a key thing the legislature needed to deal with and so we know there was a lot of pressure on legislators and and the executive branch too to figure out a solution and and try to result to at least get some sort of uh, relief past this session and the executive branch was happy with it because I spoke with Governor Little's office right after the Senate overrode his veto and you know I said you know are you guys happy about this are you guys upset about this And they said based on the fixes they see this as meaningful property tax relief the governor wanted 120 million dollars yeah. this ends up being 117 17, million yeah. so pretty close yeah and um, Jackie I guess in a way this is kind of a transparent um, in, at least in the way that it played out in public is that you saw the give and take um, and you know the governor used his power to maybe move the legislature. So this is really kind of a civics lesson on this issue. For sure. I think it was a really interesting example of how we saw the executive and legislative branch interact and engage on this policy issue with because of that veto, then the legislature did revisit it, make some changes through this trailer bill. And then and so we do see kind of that the inner the two branches interacting to help hopefully craft a better piece of legislation at the end of the day. Now, I think it's important, though, that we do point out that the Idaho Democrats see some major problems with House Bill 292 and the trailer bill in the sense that the March election date uh, for school bonds and levies, that is removed under this law. So when Governor Little talked about a hodgepodge of policies, he might not specifically be talking about what I'm talking about, but there's other pieces of the bill that have pretty big policy impacts. So for example, school levies elections in March will basically be thrown out. And the exchange here was that, okay, schools are asking for money, we're not going to allow them to ask for money in March anymore. However, we're going to supplement them in other ways. Now, this is controversial. Democrats call it a poison pill. They say that education stakeholders need this March election. Critics of that, though, say that the budgeting process is too early in the year in March and that they don't need, know what they need at that point. So that's why they got rid of the March election. Um, it'll be very controversial, though. But doesn't that depend on when the school's fiscal years are? Right. And, and, and that is that plays into it as well and the conversation of bonds and levies. But um, <laughs> we'll find out in reality how this plays out because this was now lost. Okay. All right, we're going to take a break right now. And uh, education has long been Governor Little's top priority. He had a big agenda for public schools. We'll look at where some of those big items stand coming up next on Utah. Bob's giving away $500 every weekday. Listen for the keywords at 720, 820, 920, 1220, 220, and 520. Text them in and you're entered to win $500 from 96.1. Bob FM. The first time I finally felt grown up was when I walked in to my beautiful pantry and I was like, ah, oh, okay. It's made my life so much easier, but it's also made it happier because I just like looking at it every day. I'm Erin, and this is my life with California Club. Thanks to Les Schwab Tires, I'm a constant vaccine driver, but mom's a little stressed about spending. Remember, deep breaths and watch your speed. Even though we're watching our wallets, Les Schwab is still watching out for our safety. So it's right here. During our spring tire sale, we watch out for your wallet, too. Save up to $175 when you buy select tires with financing. Les Schwab Tires. Has your cable TV lost its spark? Do you suffer from the buffer? You deserve reliable TV without the hassle and the frustration. A-plus Satellite is your premier local dish retailer, serving the Treasure Valley with reliable TV and real customer service for over 15 years. If you have Sparklight TV, switching to dish with A-plus Satellite could save you over $700 a year. Stop in for a face-to-face -face with A-plus Satellite at Fairview and Eagle, behind Krispy Kreme.
We know you're all watching the NCAA tournament and that you can't get enough hoops. So join us on the Locked On College Basketball Podcast where we are breaking down all the action, all the busted brackets, upsets, close calls, and more. Available on YouTube and anywhere else you get podcasts. 1019 The Bull is giving away $500 every weekday. Listen for the keywords at 720, 820, 920, 1220, 220, and 520. Text them to 68719 and you're entered to win $500 from 1019 The Bull. Welcome back to Viewpoint. Today we're recapping the big developments of the 2023 Idaho Legislative Session. My guests are Boise State University political science professor Dr. Jacqueline Kettler and KTVB chief political reporter Joe Paris. The governor came with a big education agenda, including grants for kids to go on to higher education. They called it the launch program. Joe, if you could, in a nutshell, just explain what happened there and also it was a really close vote. It was, and um, the, and the governor's idea was also edited slightly. So the original idea from the governor is, okay, we want to get kids into high demand jobs. These are these are jobs that Idaho needs, and these are also good career paths for, for students to get into. So if you graduate high school, we're going to give you a grant of $8,500. You can go out and get into career technical, maybe get into nursing. So that was the original idea. Long story short, through some horse trading and some legislative back and forth, that's down to $8,000, and that passed. So um, if you get a GED in Idaho or or if you uh, graduate high school, you're eligible for the Idaho Launch Grant, which gives $8,000 towards tuition. So that helps students get into programs like at the College of Western Idaho or the Lineman College, some real career technical stuff. But it's not for universities. No, right. so to that be was very clear, yeah. Yeah, that was a change in this. And uh, Jackie, what do you think made it so close? I think it was just a two vote difference in the house. Uh, a super close vote. We've had a few really close ones, but this one is interesting because it's one of the governor's top priorities, right? And mm -hmm. he was just reelected and so to see See some real intense fight on the floor about this and about the the fiscal cost, but also kind of you know the the goal, the ultimate goal here of these programs, and then really ending up focusing on the kind of the career or technical side of things. I think is really interesting to see how that proposal developed. Yeah, and one of the other big controversial issues was the ESAs, the education savings accounts. Heard a lot about that at the beginning of the session, but. Anything happened with that? Chip? Well, it kind of it kind of puttered off, and the word is that there was a version of the ESA bill that was was had some issues with it, according to leadership. And they said, if you change X, Y, and Z, we think this has got a good chance of passing. Mm -hmm. But the the sponsors of the bill, the people that were in charge of the push, they decided we like the bill as is, so this is what we're going to run with. And this is, of course, this is being able to use public tax money mm -hmm. for things like yeah. private school education. So the the basic pitch here was that we would be able to. So each student in the state of Idaho, if you go to public school, there's a certain amount of money that it is put aside you. it yeah. follows you yeah so the idea is instead of okay the state's gonna give money based on per pupil to your public school they would take that money they would give it directly to the family and the family could pay for private school tuition with it they could do homeschool and they can get some mm -hmm. educational you know devices or whatever they need textbooks so that was the pitch and there was controversy over it not only just in Idaho that public tax dollars should not be going to places like private religious schools so that's kind of where the contentious is here yeah, and, and Jackie was this kind of like a, a a political and constitutional hot potato? I think so. I think there's a few different issues. And we are seeing really similar proposals in other states as well this year and also be really controversial because of some of the constitutional questions. But also the there was a lot of questions about how much it would actually cost mm -hmm. and how an oversight as well. How do we actually ensure that money's being used appropriately, that all these other schools are also upholding to the same standards that public schools have to follow. Because they I think the argument was that there was no there would be no oversight over a public school or even a homeschooler, correct? Right, because we have all these systems built up for ensuring public schools, including pu public charter schools, you know, are the, through testing rates and all these things, but we don't have that, those systems set up for like private schools, for example. And I believe that they were basing this off of the Arizona bill, but is this coming up in other places around the country? Is this another one of those? Oh bills? yeah, I mean, coast to coast and really in conservative areas, you're seeing this push, you know, from families that say, we don't trust the public schools. We don't like what the state's doing in schools. So we'd like the money that they were going to send for our child so we could send our kids to an yeah. environment that we believe in. So that's just kind of the conversation. And you are, you're just worlds apart though, because some people think that this is the most illegal thing ever. And others think this is the state kind of pitting themselves. illegal. Right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Jackie, how does this work when you have these, these bills that come up that are so similar and they seem to come up 
at the same time across the country. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you'll have organizations or policy advocates that work on creating like sample legislation that they then will share with legislators in different states to encourage them to be introduced, or they'll work with legislators in a variety of states to try to help draft legislation for their state. But often we will see actors from outside the state that may be involved in trying to help craft some of these ideas or legislation. Um, budgets, of course, are one of the last things usually mm -hmm. that go through, Joe, and um, the education budget being the largest single piece of the general fund budget here. The governor had pushed a lot for teacher pay raises and everything, and the Joint Finance Appropriations Committee has approved those things to really bump up starting teacher pay as well as overall teacher pay. As of the taping of this show on Thursday morning, where does that stand? Yeah, and that, that looks like it's, it's going to go the distance. And talking with Superintendent of uh, Public Instruction, Debbie Critchfield, throughout the session, she's been really happy about the conversations and the dialogue in education. But the message here is that we need to support our schools and we need to support our teachers. And the way to do that is financially. So, you know, the, the, the problem in Idaho education has been teachers leaving the state. You can go to Washington or Oregon right now and you can make more money just by going to the other side of the line. So that the question is, do the raises, what do they look like when the, once they're in the budget and they're actually distributed, and are they enough yeah. to actually keep teachers here? And, and again, this was uh, budget surplus money that the governor won mm -hmm. and to shift into those areas. Exactly, and again, aligning with some of the governor's top priorities in both of his campaigns and, and, and throughout his terms. Jackie, I guess before we go, um, what has been the big takeaway for you from this, you know, part of it is that we saw these 40 brand new legislators yeah. that came in and, you know, the impact they may have had, but what is the thing or couple things that really stood out to you so far. Yeah, I think it's been really fascinating to watch a lot of the new legislators and the new like the new kind of compositions of committees and the chambers and how that has shaped how both chambers have operated, resulting in some of these really close votes on the floor, including some legis pieces of legislation defeated on the floor, which is really kind of fascinating. We don't often see a large number of bills failing on the floor. And how about for you, Joe, as someone who's there a lot? I, I thought this year was fascinating, and I really enjoyed our coverage, and I really enjoyed, you know, the, the whole new feel of the legislature coming into it. And to be honest, you know, this post, it's COVID still going on, coronavirus sure. is still with us, but this post-major COVID session was interesting because the last two years, it's just been about, you know, government controls, executive powers, virus control, and, you know, there was mRNA and COVID stuff that was brought up, but, you know, it, it was very interesting to see that uh, <laughs> this was the big conversation and the lawmakers played well together. And got back to other issues. Yeah, that, that, that it felt more traditional. Affect, uh, it did. It did a little bit differently that way. And feisty. At yeah. Times and too. Oh, there was plenty of headlines for us. Yeah. All right, Joe. Thank you, Dr. Kettler. Thank you so much for your input and your knowledge about this stuff. I appreciate you being here. Of course. Do it again sometime. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Up next on Viewpoint, something completely different from politics and government. One of nature's most amazing creatures caught in a crisis, stranded on a Washington beach. How could it possibly survive? Enter a young girl who did exactly the right thing. Martial arts is my passion. I work out whenever I can. But with my moderate to severe eczema, it can be tough. My skin was so uncomfortable. The itching was so bad. Now I'm staying ahead of my eczema. There's a power inside all of us to live our passion. And Dupixent works on the inside to help heal your skin from within. It helps block a key source of inflammation inside the body that can cause eczema. So adults can have long lasting, clearer skin and fast itch relief. Serious allergic reactions can occur that can be severe. Tell your doctor about new or worsening eye problems such as eye pain or vision changes, including blurred vision, joint aches and pain, or a parasitic infection. Don't change or stop asthma medicines without talking to your doctor. Healing from within is a powerful thing. Ask your eczema specialist how Dupixent can help heal your skin from within. Hey, Greens, how is everything going today? We're good. Just checking in on that car loan we applied for. No worries. Let me pull that up. Yep. Looks like you're approved and all set. Hey, that's great news. So, you headed over to the dealership now? Yep. Just gotta make one stop first. And we had a great rate, too. All I do is win, 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 no matter what, what, got money on my mind. 
What would you do if you came across a strange but fascinating creature washed up on the beach and still alive? Would you run? Would you try to pick it up or touch it? Would you pull out your phone and start recording? Well, someone did start recording when a young girl did exactly the right thing to help a creature in crisis. She and a group of people with a shared goal saved a giant Pacific octopus in Washington. Brady Wakayama has the story. Looks like it might be ready to try to make a break for it. Swift action taken by a group of people with one mission, getting this giant Pacific octopus back in the water. They can't survive out of water for more than several minutes. Uh, it collapses their gills. That's Annie England with the Padilla Bay Reserve. She got a call from the ranger at Bayview State Park in Mount Vernon last Wednesday about an octopus stranded on the beach. I wasn't anticipating finding such an alive, healthy octopus. England credits a little girl who was visiting the beach with her family for keeping the octopus alive. She was taking uh, water with her little sand bucket and she was filling it up and she was pouring it on top of the octopus. England says the actions taken by that little girl is the best thing you can do if you ever encounter an octopus out of the water. We would never encourage the public to try to move an octopus or touch it, um, but definitely pouring water on it and calling a local aquarium or uh, organization that you know works with marine animals. She says finding an octopus alive out of the water is not common and says this is the first octopus rescue she and her team has ever done. We had to be very conscientious of where we are putting our our hands um, while we were moving the octopus. Uh, thankfully, we were able to get it into the bin uh, and then we were able to drag it out. Octopus rescue. England says she's relieved the mission was a success and hopes the octopus doesn't have to ever experience something like this again. There goes his arm. He's feeling his way out. That's a long tentacle, isn't it? Well, all's well that ends well, as long as Ollie the octopus decides to stay in deeper waters, that is. And that's all of our time for this week's Viewpoint. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Doug Petcash. I'll see you tonight on the Sunday News at 5 and 10, and right back here next Sunday morning for another Viewpoint. I hope you have a great day. See you next time.